We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and you're listening to another one of those Football History Dude Vault episodes. This is actually part two for this week because uh, yesterday, if you didn't listen to it, first of all, you got to stop, you got to rewind, you got to go back to yesterday's episode where it's the Football History Dude Vault covering part one of the interview with Dan Carlin of Hardcore History. Now, this is the second part of that interview where we get into some more things that I really didn't know Dan was going to have so much of a breadth of knowledge and an excitement for football in general, let alone football history. So here you go. It's part two of the Football History Dude talks to one of his heroes in the podcast space, Mr. Dan Carlin of Hardcore History. On September 1st, 1939, Hitler's Germany invaded Poland, starting a cascade of events that would change the world forever. It would be two years later when the United States would enter World War II. However, in 1939, something did happen in America that would forever change the way that we view the game of football. Now this week's guest talks about why he thinks that this led to football as being America's favorite sport. And it all revolved around three little letters. N.B.C. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is October 22nd, 1939, and we are at Brooklyn's Ebbets Field to watch a game between the Philadelphia Eagles and the Brooklyn Dodgers. We're here. We're live. We're in the stadium. We're watching it. And this is a football game. Maybe not for the ages because it's just a regular old game. However, the reason why it is a game for the ages is because this is the first ever televised professional football game. And for this episode, it's also important because one could argue that this is the tipping point of the NFL and the reason why that I'm even able to have a podcast about the history of the NFL. 100 episodes in the bank. Now we're on 101. This week's guest also believes that NFL, television, they are two things that collide to create a unique and a wonderful experience. But speaking of this week's guest, this guy is Dan Carlin. The czar of storytelling. We talked to Dan Carlin last week in the 100th episode, and we're going to carry on that conversation. We're going to finish it off right here in the 101st episode. Speaking of Dan Carlin, if you don't know, and this is the first time tuning in, he's the host of one of my favorite podcasts, that is The Hardcore History. And I do feel honored bringing him on the show for the 100th episode, because man, tell you what, Dan is one of my podcasting heroes. So what better way for me to celebrate the milestone than to have Dan Carlin, the czar of storytelling, the storytelling genius, the guru, whatever have you. Speaking of that 100th episode, though, if you didn't listen to that one, it'll still work listening to this one, but you probably should mash that pause button, go back and check that one out first. And to make it easy for you to get there, you can head there through your podcast player or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com slash Dan Carlin. That's Dan, C-A-R-L-I-N. Again, thefootballhistorydude.com slash Dan Carlin. There's links to his shows and even his new book over there that you can go ahead and take a gander at and 
go ahead and let me know what's going on there. Also, while you're at it, I ask that you please subscribe for free to this show by mashing that little subscribe button in your podcast player of choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes we'll each and every week. Let's finish off the story with Mr. Dan Carlin. That's one of the questions that I always ask everybody. What if I give you the keys to my DeLorean and you could go back to any football game in NFL history to just be present? You can't change the outcome, but you can be present to actually see it and live it just like the people back then. Would you have a specific moment you can think about? Hmm. Let me think about it. I, I, I don't feel like I've missed a lot of games I wanted to watch. And the ones that I've missed, generally, they reshow uh, as long as it was it was televised. Um, no, I, I, there, there isn't any actually. I mean, I, that, that may be another example of what's great about football for the TV generation is it just seems so made to order. Like, uh, obviously you miss the fun of not knowing the outcome when you go watch the footage of something that's already been played. Uh, but if you're a fan of the game, like I am, and you enjoy the players, like I do, I like to watch the footage afterwards and the games afterwards and just sort of analyze how things broke down. I know I have a lot of friends who feel the same way. I mean, like the other day, I was actually, uh, YouTube has a bunch of uh, of old football games now that they work with the NFL. And I was watching the other day from the 1970s. Uh, I think it was an old uh, Redskins Rams game. And I was enjoying just watching how much the play selection is different from the way it is now and how much more of a running game it was back then and the different formations. I got such a kick out of that. So I, the funny thing is, is I don't have to be there live uh, to, to get a huge amount of enjoyment from analyzing and breaking down the games. And I, and I have to be honest, when I watch old baseball games, it's fun, but it's not fun like that. I mean, the, the replay value of some of this football stuff is amazing. I mean, you, you hit it on the head earlier about how NFL Films does such a great job. And Steve Sable and the guys and back then when they started it, I just... I think the world of them because they saw a vision, they just went with yeah, it. Yeah, think about what they invented. It's crazy, exactly. but but they invented that the genre, and it's fa- it's fantastic. I mean, the slow motion. I mean, they they've had a lot of specials on the making of NFL films and everything involved with it. But but that sort of thing, I agree with you. I have huge admiration. I really dig that kind of stuff when people do create those kind of genres and do those kind of things. Yeah, and then nowadays, I mean, it, we're kind of spoiled. Uh, it's it's watered down a little bit because of you have so many different avenues to be able to see it. But going back to those original NFL films and the way that they, like you said, pioneered a genre and just created something is so cool. Uh, speaking of kind of pioneering, there's a, a guy that I had an episode about that created the fantasy football. Have you ever played fantasy football? Yeah, that is about. I was doing that before my first child was born, and I had to start not paying as much of a, attention to it. Yeah, I, I, I did play. I enjoyed the draft. I enjoyed the whole. Pro- to me, that's the same kind of wargaming strategy type stuff uh, that appeals to me anyway. So yeah, definitely played it. Had a league with some friends for a while. Yeah, that's that's uh, same thing with me. I think it's why I become almost. <laughs> I could use the word addicted because I the same way. I love the strategy games. I like that types of things. The command and conquers and trying to move these all pieces around and, you know, the fog of war, see what's going to happen. What about favorite player growing up or someone that you, I guess, I don't want to say admired, but the, the person that you grew up going, holy crap, this is my favorite player. Do you have one? Oh God, I actually have lots. That's my problem is that I, I and I have the same problem in boxing too. People say, what's your favorite <laughs> boxer? I always have a boxer that I like for this reason and a boxer I like for that reason. Football is the same way. When I was a kid, uh, Johnny Unitas was still the quarterback everyone talked about, but I was too young to see Unitas play, but I grew up in the fumes. And so he was still somebody that was so talked about. And so I remember I was a Baltimore Colts fan as a kid. I have no connection to the city of Baltimore at all, but I like the Colts and I like the Orioles. I don't know why. So Johnny Unitas was the first quarterback that we ever sort of, when you'd watch new people arise, there was always the Johnny Unitas comparisons and how much does this guy remind you of Unitas and that kind of stuff. He was he was considered the prototypical quarterback of the late 50s and the 60s. And then you got Namath was the next prototypical quarterback. Um, but I, I liked Unitas. I, I liked great running backs. I mean, I'm sure it's completely uh, uh, non-politically correct to say this now, but, but uh, O.J. Simpson was amazing to watch. People forget now. I actually had seen a, a lot of those USC running backs growing up in Los Angeles, and I enjoyed watching all those guys go to the pros. Uh, I loved the the Earl Campbell type running backs. I loved John Riggins. Um, 
I, I loved all of the, the, the kind of players, too, on defense that were wonderful. The, the wonderful linebackers. I mentioned Ham and Lambert earlier, uh, but the Raiders always had great linebackers. I love teams that had uh, defensive lines. The, the Baltimore Colts in the 70s when I was growing up had a defensive line called the Sack Pack because they were so known for putting pressure on the quarterback. Uh, and it was it was a kind of football that, that had a lot of elements that I like, and you don't often see it anymore. And part of the reason why is certain positions are much harder to find great players at. Um, for example, if you're playing football in the 1960s or 70s, and your top defensive linemen are running around 250, 255 in weight, you can find a lot of people in that weight class to choose from. When your defensive linemen need to be more like 295, 320, you know, in the center, maybe closer to 340, you have a, a much smaller pool of, of talented people to choose from who are going to be really, truly great. What's more, you begin to start sharing those people with the offensive line standouts, too, that are available. Um, I always notice this in college football, where teams have a much easier time finding really quality skill players. Because there's so many more players in those weight ranges naturally to choose from. But when you've got to have the 300-pound interior defensive lineman, that's a small pool of people to choose from. So I think when you watch the teams in the early eras, there were so many more good players, especially on the defensive line, because you didn't have to be this freak of nature necessarily to qualify to play there, if that makes sense. The pool, the pool of potential people you could pick from seemed larger. That is... Uh point and a perspective I've never had anybody say, but it makes total sense. <laughs> I didn't even think about it that way before. How many 325 pound athletes are you going to run into out there, you know? Oh yeah, not not being able to run fast enough unless there's a bag of Doritos on the other end of the couch. Well, but the, you mentioned Gio, Gino Marchetti earlier. It's a perfect example because if you look at his height and weight, I think he was like 6'8", like 245, something crazy like that. So clearly able from a physical perspective to, to like, if you just looked at that, you'd think, okay, this guy could play that position today. But if if he actually had to try to maneuver with the athletes out there today, footwork wise and all that, could he do it? I don't know. Would he just be a slow kind of clumsy giant? I don't know that either. This is why I want to see it together. I want to see if and then, you know, you kind of have to ask yourself, OK, who gets to watch tape? Right. Do, if you're going to have a game between a modern team and an old fashioned team, do, do they get to watch video? <laughs> and, and how do you break that down? Right. So uh, who's on the practice squad? Right. How do you how do how do the Packers of the 1960s replicate playing a modern NFL team while they're working on the practicing? Right. But listen, I tell you what, I've had conversations about these kinds of subjects that go on for hours. You never solve anything, but it's fascinating. Yeah. The other thing that's fascinating is. The NFL just put out their hundred time, you know, all time list. I think that's a fool's errand to even try to create a hundred best players of all times, considering so many different generations and things like that. I think it's set up for the for the fun of the arguing. It's like top ten lists. It, it, it invites a conversation, and I think that's what they're after. I watched some of that too, and, and the highlight of that is watching them get the old players who played against these people. Lawrence Taylor was on, and he was talking about all these players he faced, and then they were talking about facing Lawrence Taylor. And you sit there and go, to me, that's a lot of fun. I, I like hearing that, and I, I'd love to, uh, I'd love to to see like a Gail Sayers and those kind of guys, or a Dick Butkus to, from the same team, and see how they manage today. Uh, cause some of football is, is God given skills and some of it is attitude. And I, I, I don't think that they were lacking in attitude in the old days. In fact, I suggest that if the old timers had any advantage over the new players, cause they're not going to be faster, not going to be bigger, not going to be stronger. I think the attitude that they bring to the table might be a bit of an equalizer and certainly the, the, the harder hitting style, the lack of protection for the quarterback stuff we would consider, I mean, targeting is something that wasn't a, a downside. It was something you tried to do in the early days, right? Right, yeah. Bounty Gate would have never existed back in the, in the days. When no, Bounty <laughs> Gate was more like how they did it everywhere. <laughs> yeah, a couple episodes ago, I had uh, Gene Cronin on, on the show, and being a Detroit Lions fan, it was special because he was a member of the 1957 championship, so the last time that the Lions won a, a championship. And uh he talked about the game plan on how to stop Jim Brown. And it was something I had never heard before because it was from his perspective of basically he's all like, you're not going to stop that guy. We just try to take away the long gainers. And then he told this cool story about 
the halftime game against the 49ers, the, the game before getting to the championship of how they were sitting in the locker room and they were down 20 to three or some, some, some big score at halftime. And the 49ers are banging on the lock or on the walls against them. And he said that the coach got up, who was a rookie coach at the time, who was a previous champion himself in the NFL. He gets up and he says, I'm going to have this big speech for you. I was going to tell you all these things to get you motivated, but you hear what they think of you. And he just sat down and then they came out and they ended up coming back and they ended up winning against the 49ers, came to Detroit. He tells this crazy good story that you can't hear anywhere else. And then they finally take the champ. Or I shouldn't say finally, because for my mind, they finally, but they take the championship home. And it's just cool to hear these old timers talk about stories that you're not going to get anywhere else. Well, and there's also, I mean... When I was a kid and, and you looked at certain teams, they just looked like they were practically outlaws. Like like the, the Oakland Raiders have, have never been, have not been the Oakland Raiders since the early 1980s. But if you had seen them in the 1970s, I remember I was in the news business um uh in the uh in the late 80s and there were a bunch of reporters that had worked in Oakland back in the day when the you know, late 60s, early 70s, when the Raiders were were the Raiders. And they talked about how the crowd was scary. Forget the team. I mean, it was the, the entire environment latched on to that attitude. And even today, when you think about intimidating teams, I try to remind myself, yes, but they're made up of lots of multimillionaires who, who <laughs> drive easy, who fly in private planes. The, the, the Raiders of the 70s weren't like that at all. These were guys who did hang out with bikers, who were legitimately sometimes scary. I mean, John Matuzak was the scariest football player I ever saw in person in my life. And when you have Lyle Alzado and John Matuzak playing on the same defensive line, I mean, these were people that were, you would be afraid of these people in certain situations. Forget about the football field. And they and they legitimately hung up. I mean, when you go watch movies like North Dallas 40, which is kind of based on a true story, and you see how these guys live, there's a basic toughness, win at all costs, I don't have any teeth in my head kind of NFL that the multimillionaire NFL with all its better athleticism, uh, workout machines, nutrition, year-round training, doesn't have. And I don't know how much of an equalizer it is, but even though they're 30 and 40 pounds lighter on you, position to position, I think you'd be scared of some of those teams, even today. I mean, even going back to any types of battles in history, that's that has to have happened in, in times before too, right? The I guess the the tenacity or the the fear of what's on the other side and the other guys are kind of just taking it easy. I mean, that has to have happened, even though they were the underdogs. I would love to see. So, so, so when I was talking to Russ Francis about different eras, we were trying to figure out how far back you could go and have people still be competitive. I had mentioned earlier that game between the Miami Dolphins and the Chicago Bears in 1985 that I watched with my stepdad. That 85 Bears team is not that long ago. I wonder, and they were so dominant at the time. And when you look at the size of their players, I don't think they would have been hugely outclassed on a weight and speed level. I'd love to see that team against a, a, a modern team. Part of what we have to remember, and I, I try to bear this in mind too, is that some of the novelty that they had working in their favor wouldn't be new anymore. So for example, a lot of the stuff the Bears did in, in the 46 defense is stuff that people then took and used for their own teams and then modified. So it wouldn't be so groundbreaking and surprising if somebody saw it today. Uh, but you know what? Richard Dent coming from from the outside on that, Otis Wilson, all those. I mean, I, I think they'd be a force even today. Even back in, uh, geez, I don't remember which championship it was but that the Bears won back in the 30s. But when they first brought out the wing T formation, they had played against their opponent like two or three weeks previously, and they had lost by a point or two. They ended up beating them in the championship 63 to nothing because they just were not ready for this new offense that they just had never I seen I think before. it was the Redskins they beat, wasn't it? Yeah. Were, that, they the, were they the monsters of the midway then already? Uh, I don't know if they were considered quite. That was the Redskins, though, they beat. I remember. <laughs> I, didn't see, I didn't see that game. I'm not that old, but I, do, I did learn my NFL history once upon a time. Yeah, and so then you you know of Bronco Nagurski. He's one of my favorite NFL team names of all or player names. I was going to say, I like Ray Nitschke for my names because he said he said, and I used to watch Ray Nitschke had that bald head and he wear those glasses. He looked like a professor, and then you'd listen to people talk about him, and he sounds like a homicidal maniac when you're playing against him. <laughs> right, the, the, homicidal, yeah. the homicidal maniacal professor. 
Yeah, and the other thing that I that I really love learning about the old timers is it seemed like everybody had a unique or cool nickname. Like everybody has these little parentheses in the middle of their names because everybody had a nickname. Oh, how do you like? I like Concrete Charlie, Chuck Bednarik's nickname. Yeah, God, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, he was the last. Uh, what did they call him? The last. He was the last two way man. The last, last uh, two way man. Yeah, something like that. Where he was the last like Iron Man too, or something. You ever look at the guy's hands? Do you ever get a close up of his hands? Um, you know, a guy at work actually, the, in, in my day job, that is, he has somehow because he's from he's from the same area because he's from near the Philly area, and his uncle or somebody somehow has a story where Chuck Benaric, when he was older, like we're talking like 70s, maybe even 80s, I'm not sure. I guess somebody wanted to get messing with him and he like took him out. He's like, he wasn't taking any crap no matter how old he was. Oh no, he's the kind of guy that you could say to him, what what was old time football like? And he can just hold up 10 fingers and show you because multiple fingers seem to be pointing in the wrong direction. <laughs> I mean, his, his, hand, his hand, in the same way that you can tell the old boxers by the cauliflower ears, you can tell the classic football players by, I mean, well, even Unitas, at the end of Unitas' life, I mean, he was, they're just so crippled. It is amazing what the sport does to your body over decades. And it also shows you once again the toughness of these people. I mean, the, the uh, they played with injuries. It, it's proverbial, I know. It's a stupid thing to say because everybody knows it. But they played with injuries that today the doctor would just say, "I'm sorry, you're not allowed to go back out there and play." Oh yeah, I mean, totally different scenario. Uh, going back to Jim Brown, I the past two years I was lucky enough to get the uh, media passes to go to the Hall of Fame. And last year, now I, now I don't. I've only seen highlights. I haven't, you know, I'm, I'm not old enough to really re- live it. But my dad was with me, and Jim Brown came up in the car, and he, he's of course, he's not doing well health wise, and he's got a lot of that going on. But he got out of the car, and there were so many fans that, like, they were crying watching him because of how proud they were, and they were just like, like this, they were like living legend to him. It just, it was just so fascinating to me to see this because I couldn't relate directly, but it was just, it was so cool. I'll tell you how dominant the guy was. My mom did a movie with him back in his heyday, and I met him uh, in the late '80s at, a, at an LA news station. And when I met him, he'd been out of the league. What year did he retire? Do you remember? He'd been out of the league 15 years or more. And uh, Sports Illustrated put him on the cover because there was legitimate talk of him coming back and being a running back for the Raiders. And it was one of those things where I I, I can't remember how old Brown was. So I'm I'm just throwing it out there. He might have been 45 and they were it, it reminded you like the Goldie uh, the, uh, the Goldie Howe talk with with like hockey the idea that a 45 year old this was before George Foreman and the boxing and the whole uh, the idea that a 45 year old guy could come back and play NFL football at the highest level and at the running back position seems insane and I met him and he must have been I forgot what Jim ran something like was he 62 he may not have been 62 but but he he was about 245 and like a brick house when I met him and still had no neck. I mean, it just went from like, it was this solid block of, of muscle that connected the head to the shoulders. And I thought to myself, holy cow, I don't know if his knees would hold up, but I would not want to try to stop that even in the late 1980s. And that's crazy to think that potentially, like you said, someone in his 40s legitimately could have come back at that position where Young, you know, having a young career doesn't, you don't last that long. You have to be a well, young, and Mar- young cat. Marcus Allen and Bo Jackson were the Raiders running backs during the time period. So it gives you an idea. Think about Jim Brown coming back and being at practice with those two guys. Oh, my so, goodness. Talk about, a, talk about a clash of generations. Yeah, I talk about Grantland Rice a lot and how he created the Four Horsemen. But yeah, that would have been the, the three Hydra. I don't know what I got to call them. We'll figure something out. Yeah, I don't know that I'm going to want to want to be starting next to Jim Brown. How did you get into football? Tell me your your football origin story. Why are you so passionate about it? Um, you know, I was a two sport kid as a kid. I only liked football and baseball, and I would go from uh, one to the other in terms of interest. I was never a great athlete at all. I was one of those guys who made up for what he lacked in athletic ability with just lots of practicing because I liked it. I'd throw the ball against the garage all day long, or I'd be out there throwing passes in the grass to myself and then go get the ball and throw it again. So, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed that aspect of it. But truthfully, the reason football won out, I think, as a passion for me 
is because of the similarities to war. I got I got into pl- like I said, I enjoy diagramming plays. I enjoy breaking down the stuff. Uh, I love those shows. I love how sophisticated it is now because when I was younger, they didn't have. I mean, sophistication was John Madden taking a little pointer and showing, yeah, he's going to go around the side here. We thought that was deep. Now they have these shows where they really break down. You're going to get a rub over here on this guy, and I love that. So for me. It just sort of plays into my love of the complexity of plays and schemes and designs and the exploitation of, uh, of loopholes and all that kind of stuff. It's a game sort of tailor made for people with strategic minds. And I don't know if I have a strategic mind, but I like that stuff. Yeah, I, I totally get it, too. It's, uh, but it seems to me like the ultimate team sport because of how many interchangeable pieces have to be working together to be able to get to the goal. One little chink in that armor and then the whole thing's done and now you're talking about giving up a touchdown or you're talking about, you know, some other kind of bad play happens to you and they're going the other way. I could not agree with you more. It is the ultimate team sport and I feel exactly like you do about it. You mentioned John Madden and the whole uh, announcers and you don't watch much NFL anymore. Have you been able to actually see one game with Tony Roma being an announcer? No, I have not seen. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen a whole NFL uh, game, to be honest. If you ever had, I grew up, to- listen, I, I grew up in <laughs> right. the Howard Cosell era, so that's. I mean, when, when you watched Monday Night Football back in the day, and I love that you can go watch it online now. You had Frank Gifford, Howard Cosell, and Don Meredith, and you want to talk about the an interplay and a chemistry and all that kind of stuff. It's funny because I thought one thing of it as a kid, and now when I go listen to it again, I have a completely different reaction to it. But and then John Madden came around, and I love that. So today, I, I and this maybe is just an old curmudgeon talking, but I don't feel like the modern people have the same. Uh, impact for me that the really great announcers did. But that might also be because you just don't see the great ones come along all that often. I mean, Al Michaels is one of the best, I think, still working today. Who do you like as a football announcer? So my favorite uh, game to watch, as as far as announcers go, is a Sunday night. You just you hit it on the head. I love Al Michaels. I like Chris Collinsworth, the type of things he brings to it, but he does have a lot of quirkiness. reason why I bring up Tony Romo And it seems weird because he's only been doing it for two years, I think it is. He breaks down plays and explains from a player's perspective and even a coach's perspective, unlike anybody I've ever watched. Granted, I've only been able to watch live the newer ones. But that's why I bring up Tony Romo. He talks like a strategist on the field, like a general on the field. And I think you would be interested in listening to him. I will check it out. Thank you for the recommendation. As I'm talking here, I'm killing time to go ahead and tell you when CBS is going to be on. But if you have time, the, the CBS football game, oh yeah, it's going to be Tennessee at Baltimore. And that's going to be, that'll be the Tony Romo game. So you'll get to hear him, the love fest with Lamar Jackson and everything. But he, <laughs> he will explain to you like what players are. Th- so a lot of times it's kind of annoying because he knows exactly what play they're going to play like almost every time. But it's just cool to listen to him talk about how the game breaks down. A perspective on like, like Troy Aikman, man, he's all like Buck and he's got the Bucky teeth and those guys and they're talking back and forth in that love fest. But Tony Romo breaks it down. I also think there's something to be said for how recent uh, he played the game. And I think that that like you mentioned, Aikman, uh, the game is different than when Aikman played it. Now, he's a smart guy. He can certainly stay up to date, but it's not the same uh, uh, getting up to date, analyzing things as getting up to date when you're Tony Romo and four or five years ago, you were out there facing those defenses, doing those kinds of things that they didn't do back in Troy Aikman's day. So yeah, very good point. I mean, it's, it's get to hear, hear the here and now, but uh, he, he's current. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, just, I like John Madden so much, but I think the biggest reason wasn't because of his announcing. It was because I grew up in the era when Madden was coming out. So I, I owned every Madden football game for like the dawn of time. I haven't, purchased the last one because I haven't played video games as much lately. But to me, Madden, and maybe I'd like to get your opinion because you saw it from an older perspective. I think Madden did so much for the sport of football to get that generation into the sport to be able to want to be interested in it from a different perspective, from strategic. I think now we're starting to see these different offensive gurus as far as these, like you said, coming up with these plays and these strategies. I think Madden played a big part of that, the game itself, that is. It might have, but, you know, things were heading that way anyway. I'll tell you, the first time I ever played a game, uh, well, that's not true. It even goes farther back. But I remember back in college, and I graduated in 89, so this is a long time ago. 
At the University of Colorado Student Union, they used to have a bunch of video games. And one of them was a football game. And it was the, believe it or not, it call it a proto Madden where uh, you and your buddy, he'd take one side, you take the other. They had all these plays you could look at. He would pick plays, you would pick plays. I mean, in a funny way, there were the graphics, I think, were literally circles and X's. I mean, that's how basic it was. But my God, you were throwing passes. You were you were trying to get guys past. I mean, it was the prototype for the whole thing. And without any graphics at all, it was absolutely addicting. Once again, I would argue that it's a game, football meaning, that lends itself to all those kinds of things. Now, it's, uh, let's say baseball. Baseball and basketball are fun video games to play, but they're nothing like playing football video games in terms of the addictive nature of it and how well it seems to translate into that medium. So if you say it helped, that didn't hurt. I think both my girls learned how football works playing football video games. Where would you like the fans of the show to go if you if they want to learn more about Dan Carlin? Oh, just go to dancarlin.com. That usually has most of the stuff. All right. Any last words of wisdoms for the fans of the show before we go? No, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. I hope everybody gets a kick out of it. And I don't screw up your format too much by having a history podcasting guy on the football program. Well, how about it? What do you think about having a different perspective on football. Maybe he's not the history guy about football, but he's the history guy that tells great stories on a football show. I mean, personally, I loved it. Like I said, I'm a podcasting hero, and I hope that you did too. I mean, it amazes me how much Dan Carlin knew about the history of the game. I was kind of shocked and surprised. I was blown away. I didn't realize that he had that much involvement previously with the NFL and I, again, thought no better way to celebrate the 100th episode, and well, now we're on 101, with my podcasting hero. But also, I walked away with some incredible football stories that I hadn't even heard before. So if you also like the show, then I ask that you please subscribe for free to the show by mashing that little subscribe button in your podcast player choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes each and every week. And while you're at it, why don't you go ahead and share with a football geek such as yourself. That way, they can hear about these gridiron knowledge nuggets themselves. The best way to do that is to take them over to thefootballhistorydude.com for more information on the show and anything else related to the NFL. Now, next week, we're going to bring on another guest to drop some gridiron knowledge nuggets about you. This time, it's in the fantasy football realm. Mike Wright of the award-winning Fantasy Footballers Podcast stopped by on the show to walk down the memory lane of his experiences starting a podcast about fantasy football. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. Put up my replica 1909 World Series program poster from Row One Brand. And that's all it took for Marla to do a complete redesign of the Guardian offices, doing up the walls with tremendous prints from baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and more sports events. And every one of them can't help but trigger memories of sports yesteryear. And here's the last one. Let's put it up here by your desk. Perfect. Oh, that's a nice one. College football, 1923, Navy versus Penn State. Do you remember that game, Marla? I sure do. It was October 20th, 1923. Cloudy, but a reasonable 57 degrees at the 2.30 kickoff time. Over 20,000 turned out at Beaver Field in College Station, Pennsylvania for this clash of two of the nation's top teams. The Nittany Lions were the underdogs, despite having won their first three games by a combined score of 94 to nothing. The heavy favorites were the midshipmen, who went on to play in the Rose Bowl after the season. Right, and the game immediately became... The entire color of the game would ultimately be dominated by Penn State's star halfback, Harry Wilson. But both offenses took some time to get going for a good 22 minutes before Wilson got the crowd to their feet with an interception of Bill McKee's forward pass, returning it all the way for his first touchdown of the day. 
Wilson certainly was great On the that. next kickoff, who would end up as returner but Harry Wilson? Wilson dodged at least a half. Dozen Recall the greatest moments in sports history or just your own personal favorites with Row 1 Brand Sports Paraphernalia. Don't delay. Visit today at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full Row 1 catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, Telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act A for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan. When the gun started to mark the Olympics, the will remain Penn State 14 Navy 0. The second half had barely begun when Harry Wilson and Penn State went on to work on Navy again.